Good morning and welcome to the Auburn Church of Christ. This is May the 31st, 2020. Glad that you've joined us. As we've done most weeks, we're going to have a few encouraging words from the Steeds. And then Jim Stone is going to be doing communion for us this morning, leading our thoughts and prayers. We're also going to have a time of worship this morning that's going to be integrated in with this video that you can sing along with. And we'll all be singing along together. So thank you for watching. God bless you. Happy Lord's Day. And I'll see you in a few minutes. Hey, good morning, all you Auburn brothers and sisters and beyond. Linda and I are out here on our back deck, and uh, we're very appreciative to Matt for giving us a chance to say a few encouraging words to you together today. Uh, we've enjoyed seeing those who have shared in the past, and um, it's just our privilege to say something today. And I've got my girlfriend Linda with me here tonight, and she's going to talk and say some things first. Hello, my sweet Auburn friends. It's so good to be able to speak to you. We've been listening to some of your encouraging words each week, and it's just so wonderful to get to see your faces again. I just wanted to, to share a, a few little thoughts that I've been um, contemplating. I know when Courtney and John were speaking the other day, Courtney was talking about 2 Corinthians 1 and 2, and that's one of my favorite uh, passages about comfort carriers or being um, showing our comfort to others. And I love that phrase, being a comfort carrier. And I think that's a, a good way to be encouraging to others is to bring comfort to them. And another thing is to be refresher of others. In Proverbs um, 11, 25, we can refresh others by being refreshed ourselves. And we can show good to others and seek good in others. And that is something I'd like to just think about a little bit. And that is we don't need to feel guilty about uh, taking time for ourselves during the the COVID um, virus shutdown or shelter down that we're doing because it might be a way of replenishing and refreshing ourselves so that we can be more to others and meet their needs. And so don't feel guilty about this time, but take it as a time of building and refreshing yourself. So it just may be God's way of slowing you down. And one more thing I just wanted to share with you is um, from the book, A Year of being happy. Um, the author talks about uh, don't ask why this is happening, but ask what does God want me to do? How does he want me to respond? And what does he want me to learn from this? And how can I help others with what I'm learning? So I hope these little bits of encouragement will help you. And I just want you to know that you are never far from my heart. And you all mean uh, so much to me. And I love you all. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, uh, the first chapter, verse 2, We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by the hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Downstairs in the basement, you know, I'm a bit of a pack rat, but I've been carrying around all the cassette tapes that were accumulated over the years, and I've been sorting them recently, and when I put my hands on them, I see sermons by wonderful people, Dwayne Powell, Jim Brinkerhoff, um, funeral services that have been recorded, and I, I can't, I'm, I'm working to get those in the proper hands and digitize Jack Wilhelm, but what happens is, when I touch them, it just gives me all the memories of being with you and all the things that the Auburn Church of Christ has done all through the years. And so I believe there's a great future ahead. And during this time, concentrate on your spirituality, develop deeply your relationship with God, your personal relationship, and soon you'll all be back together sharing, hugging, and being God's people together again. We love you, and we think of you every day in thousands of ways. Bye for now.
Perhaps this is a unique problem of mine, but over the years I have been very concerned on how to focus my thoughts during the time of communion. When I was in the fifth grade, my Sunday school teacher related the story of how when her mom partook of the communion, tears would flow down her face. I assumed those were tears of sadness, could have been tears of joy, she didn't explain, but I drew the conclusion that perhaps my thoughts should be more model in their nature, in other words, sad, focused on Jesus' suffering and dying, all for our benefit. In time and the passage of years, I've now concluded that Jesus doesn't really want or desire my sympathy for his sacrifice. He has no need, he has no desire for my empathy either for his suffering. Instead, I believe Jesus talking to me wants me to focus and understand the motivating love that he has for all human beings his willingness to set an example of giving it all to bring hope and salvation to humankind. In other words, Jesus always set his examples of being about others, never, never about himself. And this helps me to understand why he introduced the concept of communion as a part of the human fellowship activity as he and all of his intimate friends and followers were gathered there in that upper room to observe the Last Supper. Now, when he broke the bread, the unleavened bread, and indicated that would represent his body, when he poured the wine and said that would represent his shed blood, and then he said, do this in remembrance of me. Even as he said that, I personally am convinced that Jesus was not just focusing on himself, but rather he was anticipating future generations of people, including us, coming together in worship to renew their mutual bonds of Christian fellowship, and they were driven to that purpose by their love one for another. He even envisioned that as they communed together, I believe, not only would they recollect the hope and promise of Jesus himself, but it would also be a time to remember their love for each other, a time to express mutual appreciation, and a time to reach out and lift each other up. And so I just pray that these sentiments will fill our hearts and our minds today as we partake in these symbols of remembrance. Will you pray with me? Eternal Father, once again you bring us face to face with your son Jesus, dying on that cross as a sacrifice to pay for our sins. And even today as we partake of this bread, symbolic of his crucified body, may we accept him as the pattern for our individual lives and the pattern for unity and for love for each other in this congregation. And Father, as we're gathered today, although distanced from each other, we pray that we're still in your presence and we want you to refresh our memories so that we can continually be reminded of how important 
each of us is to the other as we go about serving our individual roles in being a part of your spiritual body and your community of believers. Now, Father, may your heart become our heart and may Jesus' life and example become our life and our example. In his name we pray, amen. Would you pray with me again? Oh, Father, as we partake of this cup, symbolic of Jesus' blood, we're reminded of how Jesus shed blood cleanses our sins and imparts a righteousness to us that enables us to stand guiltless before you and serve all of your noble purposes. Oh, Father, please open our eyes and bless us today so that we can at last see and feel just how magnificent your gifts have been and continue to be and offer hope for the future. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I have always been so fond of John 3.16 simply because the opening words, for me at least, frame the entire Bible. They show us what all of God's purpose was from the beginning unto its conclusion. Those words are, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Now look at the linkage. God gave because God loved. That's why humans exist. God loves and he created us. So loving and giving are all part of the formula for God. And how could we accept anything less than loving and giving in our lives? He wants all of us. He wants our time, but he wants our material blessings as well. Consider that as I offer this prayer. Oh, Father, how remarkable it is that we as human beings created in your image are also unique among all living creatures because only we have been given the ability to amass material possessions far in excess of our daily requirement. And now, this morning, we pray that you'll give us wisdom and teach us, Father, a healthy attitude toward our earthly possessions so that our capacity to love you may grow. Please accept our gifts today as cheerful expressions of our love for you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. On behalf of the elders, I just want to pause a moment and thank all of you for continuing to maintain your contributions. Thus far, we have been blessed more than we anticipated might be the case. Our contributions have remained remarkably constant during all of this time of upheaval and disturbance. And we pray that you'll continue to remember making your weekly contributions or monthly, whatever you prefer. But you'll continue your diligence until we're back in the building together again. Now, you can go to our website and find various avenues for giving your gift, certainly online as an alternative. However, I'll remind you that when you make a large monthly contribution, for example, 
our transactional fees are about 2%. So 2% of what you give doesn't actually get to the church with online gifts. So if you're making large contributions, perhaps still a stamp in an envelope is the best approach there. I look forward to being back with you soon, and I think you'll hear news to that effect in the coming days or weeks, perhaps. But in the meantime, may God bless you. May God keep you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. It has felt to me over the last week or so that we need a tighter thread to run through our lessons. And I was thinking about the continuity that comes through having a theme. And it's very important for us to have things to look forward to and not just disconnected lessons week in and week out. That was important in the beginning as we discussed topics that seemed to make sense as we were entering into a series of unknown events. And at this point in time, I want to carry on the theme from last week and hit on this for the next several weeks is the theme of being prepared. It's really, really important for us, as we talked about last week, to be people who are prepared because we have been given a very important mission and purpose and identity in the world. When it comes to being prepared, there are several things from the biblical perspective that we can do to prepare ourselves in the world for the things that happen next, for the opportunities that are coming and the things that God is doing in the world that we can participate in and be a part of. We need to be preparing now for when those times come later. You know, Jesus was very purposeful in prayer. In the Gospel of Mark, it's just one chapter in Mark 135, it talks about Jesus going off and finding a solitary place for himself to pray. The context of that statement is that Jesus has been going around on his mission, he's been healing people, he's been teaching, casting out demons, and he finds time to get away from the crowds, to get away from all the attention, and time just with himself and the Father. You know, it's really tempting to be in the limelight, it's tempting to draw attention to yourself, but Jesus understood that even though everyone was looking for him, everyone wanted his attention. They all wanted something from him. And I would like to read those words from Mark chapter 1, 35 to 39. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to find a solitary place, and he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. And so they traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. If Jesus Christ, Son of God, Messiah, needs time with God, needs time to pull away from people, needs time in solitude, needs time in prayer, God in the flesh, God incarnate, needs time to have this communion, to have this time of fellowship, time of conversation, time of connection with his Father, how much more do we need that if Jesus himself needs that? Sometimes I think maybe, we, again, we seek out the crowd, we seek out the attention, we seek out other people, but we do need some time with just us and God. In ministry, we have to make a distinction between personal study and private study. Study that's for preaching and teaching class that other people will benefit from and hear, and then preaching and teaching that's just for our own connection and relationship with God, our own faith development and maturity and knowledge. Same is true with prayer and ministry. There are people we pray for, sometimes publicly, sometimes in a more of a private setting, one-on-one -on -one with people. But, you know, if our prayer life is not solid, just us and God, you know, that's, that's really the most important part. It's really the foundation of everything. So Jesus found a solitary place where he was praying, even though he knew that everybody was looking for him. Prayer is part of our preparation. Being in close fellowship with God, close connection with our Father, is part of us preparing for the next leg of our journey, whatever that may be. We need to be talking to God about the things that are coming up. We need to be, in, a, in that prayer conversation, it's going to be preparing our hearts and our minds for whatever it is that God has next for us. You know, we think about praying for a spouse. We think about praying for our children. We pray for our children's spouses. You know, we pray for our grandchildren. We pray for all these different things. Those are preparation prayers. We pray for things long in advance, weeks, months, years, decades in advance. Those are good prayers. And we need to think about the kind of things that we should be praying about today 
and the kind of relationships that we, that we form with God, not just in praying for preparation, not just for praying for future things, but the kind of relationship that we form with God when we talk to him regularly about things. It is that relationship itself that is going to be the preparation, not just that we ask God to prepare us, but that we know God intimately enough that when things happen, we are prepared because we are connected with our Father. It's a very important distinction. Eight chapters later in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus it comes up to the Mount of Transfiguration. He takes Peter, James, and John up on the mountain with him. At the bottom of the mountain are the nine disciples. And Jesus is changed before their eyes. He's transfigured. His figure is changed, transfigured. Moses and Elijah appear. Peter begins to speak unknowing really what to say. And he says, we should build booths for each of you. Moses and Elijah. And Peter's just confused. He's, he's terrified. And he blurts this out. And so Jesus, uh, this voice from heaven comes and it says, this is my son whom I love. And whom, uh, listen to him. Listen to him. Now, this is not anything about prayer at this point, but what ends up happening is Jesus and the three come down the mountain. They find the nine at the bottom of the mountain. And when Jesus left them at the bottom of the mountain, there was a father who came up to the nine. And the father had a demon-possessed son. And he has his son with him. And he has asked the disciples to cast out the demon. And they've been trying and trying with no success. Jesus comes into the situation, assesses the situation, asks things like, well, how long has he been this way? And the boy's on the ground and it's seizure, almost like thrashing around with this demon possession. And Jesus casts out the demon. He casts out the demon by ordering the demon out, commands the demon to be gone. And when the disciples see him do that, they ask Jesus this question, like, how do you do that? We tried and tried, what else could we have done? What, you know, like, what's the instruction here? How do we do these kind of demons? And Jesus says something about preparation and prayer. He says, this kind can only come out through prayer. In some versions, it's going to say fasting and prayer. We can talk about why that is sometime, why the difference is, but you get the point that Jesus is saying, well, first let's sit on what he's not saying. Jesus is not saying that when you get in this situation, you are to stop everything and begin to fast and pray on that moment and then cast out the demon and it will happen. Lickety split. Not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that if you need to have already been fasting and praying so that when you encounter these kinds of demons, you'll be prepared to cast it out. The fasting and prayer is done before you're in the circumstance where the preparation is needed. This is what preparation is. You never prepare for something in the moment in which it happens. You prepare for something which is, again, the very definition of preparation. It's something that's done in advance so that you're ready when the time comes. We think about if you were a firefighter and your job was to protect people, was to help people, get people out of burning buildings and things like that. And so in your mind, you knew, well, I'm a firefighter, this is what I do. But in reality, you are sitting on, on the couch in the firehouse, just gaining, gaining, gaining weight till you're up to five, 600 pounds. And, you know, say the alarm rang and you were the one there to go out and, you know, rescue the people, you wouldn't be able to do it. Why? Because you had not been diligent and disciplined in preparing for the task that had been put before you so that when the emergency came, you would be ready to address it. Because you never know, pointing back to last week's sermon, you never know when the emergency is going to come. You must be prepared in advance. When the emergency comes or the situation changes or the circumstances change, it's too late to begin preparing. You have to prepare now for what you're gonna need later. And that preparation is gonna come through prayer. There is just far too much on the line for us to not be prepared. For us to not be prepared with the gospel of Christ, for us to not be prepared with an encouraging word, for us to not be prepared to serve and love those around us, for us to not be prepared to live the kind of Christian life we need to live in this world, far too much on the line for us to not be prepared. This is why Jesus stressed it over and over again in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, some of the very last things he said before he was arrested, crucified, buried, and risen. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus has just fed the 5,000. And he sends his disciples on a boat to go, I believe it was to Bethsaida. And it says that Jesus goes up on a mountain to pray. The disciples are on the boat going across the sea. Jesus goes up on a mountain to pray. 
Now there's discussion over why on a mountain, you know, are you getting closer to God when you go up high? You know, there's there's not anything scriptural about going higher is closer to God, higher is closer to heaven. You know, we know that's not the case. You know, the earth is round and if you're on the bottom and you're going higher, then you're going lower from our perspective and those sorts of relative things. There is a, a sense, not in a geospatial way that you're getting closer to God the higher you go. We know that God is ascendant. He's above all things. There is a symbolic sense in which we are closer with God when we're in these kind of places, but we know that we can be as close to God in one place as we are another. There's not anything magical about uh, any given place because God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. But Jesus has chosen to go up on this mountain to pray, to connect with his Father, to commune with his Father after doing this amazing miracle of feeding 5,000 people in the wilderness who had no food. And when Jesus comes down the mountain, he begins to walk to the boat across the lake. The disciples are without Jesus. The disciples see him coming. They think he's a ghost. They're very afraid. And, and they don't lose that fear until Jesus is back in the boat with them. And, and I want to stress one thing on this story. We've hit Mark 1. We've hit Mark uh, 8. We've hit Mark 1. We've hit Mark 9. Now we're in Mark 6. Mark's a wonderful gospel. I encourage you to read it on some of your downtime. So here in Mark chapter 6, verse 45, uh, you know, again, he's come down the mountain. He's walking out across the water. It's not till Jesus is with them that they're not afraid. And he says to them, don't be afraid. It's I. And what literally what he says is, I am. Just like uh, Moses at the burning bush. Who is it who I am to say, sent me to you, Pharaoh? And God says, tell him that I am sent you. This is the divine name in in a sense that Jesus is saying that he is God in the flesh, don't be afraid because I am, Jesus is saying. But again, it's the proximity. Jesus is seeking proximity, closeness with his Father, and the disciples don't need to be afraid when Jesus is near. The same is true when Jesus calms the storm. He's in the boat with them, there's really nothing to fear, but they wake him up and they beg him to help, and Jesus doesn't bail water, he commands the storm to stop. Being in proximity, closeness, and I'm not talking geospatially, like closeness, like how many inches are you from God? God is all around us. God is even in us through the Holy Spirit. When you talk regularly with God, it develops a proximity, a relational proximity. And it helps us, it strengthens us, it encourages us, it prepares us. And there's no need to be afraid. There's no need to be terrified. And there's no need for us to not be able to do the things that God is calling us to if we will allow Him to help us prepare for things in advance. And part of us doing our part in that is to spend more time in prayer. Now, if you go out on your own and you're distant from God and you don't really care to be close to God, you have no relationship with God, then there are things that we should be concerned about. There could even be things that we should be a bit fearful about. Think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's about to be arrested. He's about to be beaten. He's about to be uh, struck with clubs, punched, spit upon, uh, put on trial, crucified, nails in the hands and the feet, spear in the side. He's going to go through complete agony and shame. How does Jesus prepare prepare for that moment? He prays. Read the Gospel of John 16, 17, 15 in there. And read Jesus' prayer. He's preparing for what's to come. Let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless not what I will, but what you will be done. Jesus is preparing for the most pivotal moment in his life through time and prayer. It's what he does. And if Jesus is our instructor, if Jesus is our teacher, if he's the one showing us the way, the the way to the Jesus life, if we're disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus, following his lead, it would only make sense that as we come up against difficult things or new circumstances, that we would find time to pray and connect with our Father for him then to assist us through these things because he knows the things that we don't. You know, when you think about Paul's letters, He starts all of his letters with a prayer, mostly. And I can't help but think that that prayer is is for himself. He's about to write the letter. 
and that his prayer is for them as they're about to receive the letter. Paul is preparing people to hear what he is going to tell them in prayer. And he wants them to hear his prayer as he writes these prayers down for them to experience and to hear on their end. So what would this look like from a practical perspective? What, how do we prepare ourselves in prayer? Is it a specific prayer we pray? Is it you know, a time to pray, a routine of prayer? Here's what I want to say about that is, get to know God. Spend time with Him. Talk to Him regularly. Make Him a part of your day. Just like there would be someone in your household who wouldn't walk by without you saying something to them. Realize that God is present in your life and begin talking to Him regularly. And what you're going to find is, is there's not, not a specific preparedness prayer that we can give verbiage to, to be prepared for something. Now we can look at something coming and say, God, will you please prepare me for that or prepare me even for the things that I don't yet know to be prepared for. We can pray all kinds of prayers about it and those are good prayers. But the most important thing is that you have a connection with God, that you know Him. He knows you, do you know Him? And the more you get to know Him, the closer you get to His heart, the more prepared you are going to be for what is coming because you are going to know God, you are going to love God, and you are going to be in tune with His voice to hear what He's trying to tell you, to be able to be guided by Him into the things that are next. So this is what it looks like. I would encourage you to, to make a list of things in your life that, that maybe you feel ill-prepared for and just begin talking to God about it. Asking Him to shed light on these different circumstances, opportunities, relationships, things that have come up. Don't, don't be caught unprepared. Being caught unprepared, again, means not looking out for the least of these, loving our neighbor as ourselves, and also not loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And if we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, the greatest commandment, we will talk to Him, we will pray to Him, we will be in regular connection, communion, uh, conversation with our Father. That is what preparation looks like. And I encourage you to, to, to do it, to practice it, to be a part of it. You will not go wrong. So I want to wrap this message up just by saying that you are loved, that you belong in the body of Christ, that if you are not a part of the body of Christ, that you are invited in. And we want you to know that Jesus loves you, that we love you. And if there's anything at all we can do, any questions you have, uh, any concerns that you have, please don't hesitate to call me, to text me, to email me. And I'll put that information on the screen, 334-750-9919 or dabs at auburnchurch.org. And I look forward to hearing from you in the email, and on the phone, and the text, with whatever concerns you, you have. If you want to be baptized into Christ, we will take care of that right now. Just let me know, and we will be more than happy to take care of that and help you make that right. And as you submit to God and, and allow Him to bring about the healing and the cleansing, and the giving of new life in the Spirit. So we appreciate so much you watching, and the hope and prayer is that you have been blessed this morning, and that we as God's people can be prepared for what it is God is trying to get us to do and who He is trying to get us to be. God bless. Thanks for watching, and we will see you next week.